Psalm 23, we've been studying this psalm on Wednesday nights, and God just led me in this message to come on Sunday morning with it. I believe it'd be a message for this hour, and maybe we will not live to see this Wednesday night. I don't know. The Lord may return. We're looking for that soon return of our Lord. But either way, we'll be back in it, Lord willing, Wednesday night too. But uh, we've been looking at the Psalms and uh, giving uh, several messages, kind of introducing us. Uh, remember, Psalms teaches us how to walk with God. And uh, I gave an introduction to the psalmist, God's man, David, the man after God's own heart. And uh, then I gave an introduction to the book of Psalms by looking at the psalm that contains, uh, Psalm 29 there, that contains the key verse of Psalm. Remember Psalm 29, 2, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and how the Lord should receive glory in the church. And after that, we were introduced to the psalmist and got introduced to the book of Psalms. Then we introduced to the shepherd in Psalm 23, the shepherd. You know, Psalm 23 has troubled, has comforted troubled hearts for centuries. Uh, Psalm 23 has been a psalm uh, that is many times learned as a child, but it's a psalm for all of life. You often hear it at funerals, and certainly there is a message uh, for the sorrowing, but I don't want to leave it there, just the funerals. There is a message for every day. The Bible says here in Psalm 23, all the days of my life. There's a message for all the days of our lives, not just at death. Psalm 23 focuses on what Jesus does for us. And David's looking back, I believe, in Psalm 23. And he was a shepherd, of course, but he's thinking about how his shepherd has cared for him all these years. Some of us have lived longer than others in here. I recognize that. But you that have lived a little length of time can look back and see, boy, how God has cared for me. How God has met my need. How God has done everything that you find here in Psalm 23. This is a psalm of the great shepherd who cares for his sheep, who, who equips us uh, for serving him, for ministry. And the psalm is divided into three parts. We're not preaching the whole psalm today, but just giving a little introduction uh, David, first in, the, in Psalm 23, takes us to the glen, if you will. Uh, then he takes us down to the gorge in that valley. And then finally on into glory. Hallelujah. Uh, and he introduces us to the shepherd, the one who's able to take care of our frailty. Uh, he introduces us to the one who's able to help us against our foes. And then, of course, to the one that can care for our future forever in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, our world is full of wanting people. Wanting, wanting, wanting. But if you know this shepherd, you don't have to want anymore. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't have to want anymore. I have a shepherd. Praise the Lord. And we've talked about this already, but that key that opens up the whole chapter, the whole psalm, excuse me, is the word my. The Lord is my shepherd. Do you know he's your shepherd this morning? He's not just a shepherd. He's not just the shepherd, though he is that. But most importantly, you know he's your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Has there been a time in your life that you've come to know him as your shepherd? You put your faith and trust in him as your savior? You see, the Lord is my shepherd He's my savior. He's my sustainer. Really, that phrase could go through the whole psalm here. Look at the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want the Lord is my shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And you could go on thinking of that. Do you know he's your shepherd? If you died today, do you know you'd be in heaven with him? The Bible says in Jesus, when he's on this earth, would continue that same theme. He said, I am the door. There are people, there are sheep that are inside his fold, and there are sheep that aren't. He wept over Jerusalem. Why? Because they were sheep scattered, but no shepherd. Jesus wanted to be their shepherd. Now I'll tell you tonight, it doesn't matter what your life has been like to this point, I want you to know Jesus wants to be your shepherd. He died on Calvary, not for the sin of the person beside you only. Not for just the sin of your parents or the sin of your siblings. God died on the cross for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'll tell you, when you put your faith and trust in him, the Bible says that he gives unto you eternal life and ye shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck you out of the Father's hand. Isn't that wonderful? You know this morning that he's your shepherd. Do you know if you died, you'd be in heaven? you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know he lives inside of you? Well, if you do, everything in this psalm is for you. You're one of his sheep. If you don't this morning, I want you to know Jesus is reaching to you. And he desires that you would come to him and receive him as your savior and let him be your shepherd. In just a moment, we'll have an invitation, have an opportunity where you can come and receive Christ as your savior. Look, when you know the Lord is your shepherd, you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret anymore because he's promised to meet every need of your life. He's the shepherd. When you say in your heart, the Lord is my shepherd, then you can also say, I shall not want. I have a shepherd and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows my everything. He knows the needs I don't even know yet. He is my shepherd. Hey, when Jesus is your life, he shares his life with you. You know, when we live outside of ourselves, meaning we do things that we thought we never could do. And as Paul would say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He literally is sharing his life with us. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so when he's your shepherd and when you let him lead your life, he shares his life with us. He cares for us as though we were the only care and concern he had in the universe. Last Sunday, our family saying, he loves me like I was his only child. That's true. You don't have to wait in line. <laughs> you don't have to wait till there's an opening. You don't have to make an appointment. He cares for you and me. He cares for each of us like that. What a God we have. What a savior. Psalm 23, you found it? Let's stand together, if you would, and we're going to quote it together. If you say, I can't quote it, then read it. It's okay. But if you can quote it, many of us know it. It's very familiar. Then quote it along. Psalm 23, ready? Go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to bring the message on this title. The shepherd makes all the difference. We're coming to this phrase here in verse two. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. Don't you know the shepherd makes all the difference? Let's pray. Father, help us please as we look in your word now. Lord, you can only press by your Holy Spirit this truth to our heart and help us not just to hear a message, but to make the truth of your word a part of our life and go out and live it. Would you help us now? Would you speak to each and every one of us as if we were the only one in the room? And we know when we leave this place that we've heard your voice and we'll thank and praise you for it. Now, surely in a group this size, there's one that's lost, Father. In their heart of hearts, they know they can't honestly say that you're their shepherd that they know that you live inside of them, that they know if they died this moment or 10 years from now that they're in heaven and they know that. They, they couldn't say that, Lord. I pray that in this service they would come to know you as their Savior. They would put their faith and trust in you, turning from their sin and hell that is the end of their life and rather turn to you and be saved and heaven be their eternal abode. And we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. He leadeth me. Where should we place the emphasis? Again, we're tempted to place the emphasis, aren't we, on leadeth or on me or maybe beside the still waters. But we've learned already in Psalm 23 that the emphasis must always be on where? The shepherd. Oh, yeah, the shepherd. He leadeth me. You see, the shepherd makes all the difference. The shepherd makes all the difference. See, God leads his children. Ira Sankey, 
who for years led the music for D.L. Moody, uh, was on a steamboat back in 1875, Christmas Eve. He's traveling uh, there on uh, Christmas Eve in 1875, and he was recognized by some of the passengers on the steamboat. And of course, they asked, would you sing for us? So he agreed and began to sing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Well, when the song was done, one of the listeners stepped forward and he said, did you serve in the Union Army? Yes, Mr. Sankey answered. Can, can you remember doing picket duty on a bright moonlit night in 1862? Yes. I was serving in the Confederate Army. When I saw you standing at your post, I raised my gun. I took aim. I was standing in the shadow, hid, hid underneath, but you were right bright in the moonlight. And just as I took aim, you raised your eyes to heaven and all at once started singing. <laughs> the same song you just sang just now. Let him sing his song to the end, I said to myself. What's the hurt? I can shoot him afterwards. He said, I could hear the words perfectly. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Thou hast bought us, thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Thou hast bought us, thine we are. And then the second verse, we are thine. Do thou befriend us. Be the guardian of our way. He said, as you sang that, I began to think about my mother, my childhood, and my God-fearing mother that used to sing that song to us. When you finished, it was impossible for me to take aim again. And I thought, the Lord who is able to save that man from certain death must surely be great and mighty. <laughs> he leadeth me. What a shepherd we have. We will learn last week in Genesis that as we studied there in Genesis 21, how God wants us to know that he hears us. The Bible said there, I've heard the lad where he is and God, God wants you to know that he hears you. Not only that, know that he sees us. It would be backed up in Hagar's life to Genesis 16 where uh, she met the Lord and, and God appeared to her and, and she said, thou God seest me. And what a wonderful truth to know our God hears us and God sees us. And then we looked at how God wants us to know and we need to know that God wants to open our eyes. God has something he wants us to see. God wants to show us something. We uh, thought even about Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee. God sees you. God hears you. Call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Listen, God wants to show you something. Look, you're not in this life by accident. You're not living these days or this season of your life by accident. God is at work and God wants you to see something. God wants to show you something. He wants to show you, first of all, himself. And then he wants to show you his way and he wants to lead you. That's true for every one of us in here. And this goes so amazingly with Psalm 23. I believe the Lord wants to be here this morning, I want you to know this morning that God is leading you. Know that God is leading you. If you know him as your savior and the Lord is your shepherd, this theme is not just in this verse. In fact, let me show you uh, this, this thought of the leadership of the shepherd. Uh, notice he says in verse two, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Verse three, he restoreth my soul. Then he says again, what? He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You find that this theme of the leadership of the Lord, our shepherd, is all the way through the psalm. He leadeth me. Number one, I want you to see God is leading me. Would you say that with me? God is leading me. What love that I enjoy every day. Every moment of every day, if you know the Lord is your Savior, what love you enjoy. Listen, you should never wonder if God loves you. Not since the cross. You should never wonder if you're accepted. Hey, God loves you. 
You're accepted in the beloved. God wants you. He came for you. He died for you. Think about the love of our shepherd. My God and my shepherd is leading me. He's not just leading, but he's looking over. Like a shepherd looks over his flock. He's looking over me and he's meeting the needs. Needs maybe I don't even know I have yet. And he's giving strength. And he's giving comfort. And he's giving assurance. And praise the Lord, reassurance. And love. And joy. And peace. And the Bible uses this word, loving kindnesses. And mercy. And grace. And compassion. The Bible says he pities us. He, he shows compassion he pities his children and defense and protection and shielding and, 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 and we could go on, couldn't we? All of that every day. I praise the Lord Jesus Christ. My shepherd has not given up on me. He's not moved off of me or moved on to someone else or something else. Our God is still leading me. And you need to know, and God wants us to know, God is leading you. He loves me. That will never change. He is always and will always be doing what he is doing at this moment. Caring for me. Caring for you. Working on me and working on you. Working in me and working in you. Working through me and working through you. It's God that's doing that. Why? For what purpose? To make me into his image. The image of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is leading me, number one. Number two, God is always leading me. Uh, see, God doesn't place anything in his word by accident. And it's interesting here that this phrase is repeated not just once, but twice. He leadeth me, verse three, he leadeth me. And as you read through the rest of the chapter, you're going to, or the psalm, you're going to see that he is leading when I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. He's leading when it's time to eat. He's preparing a table. He's already leading. He is leading me. God is always leading me. Even when I can't see it. Even when it doesn't make sense, I must know God is always leading you must know God is always leading you. And I have to remind myself, I have to encourage myself in the Lord that this didn't surprise God. God is never surprised. God is never taken by surprise. God knew and God is always leading me. At our Independent Baptist Friends of Alabama meeting this Thursday night where the singles were at the same place as it led into their equip conference there. And Evangelist Scott Pauley was speaking to the men and at the same time, Miss uh, Joy Lewis was singing to the ladies. And anyhow, um, Brother Scott Polly, he spoke to the men about the seasons of life and the seasons of ministry. And he shared seven truths about that. Let me share them with you. Uh, number one, he shared all of life is marked by seasons from Ecclesiastes chapter three. All seasons were created by God. Genesis one, God controls the seasons. He created the seasons. And by the way, Daniel two says he changes the seasons. Hallelujah for that. Number two, he gave not only all of life is marked by seasons, but every season is different. Every season is different. We're in a new season for us in our home. There's a teen activity. We have no one home, you know. All the, all, they're all teenagers. That's a new season for us, you know. And we're all moving in different seasons. In just a few days, we'll move into the 40s. She's been there, but I've not. The 40s season, it's a new season. You say, 40s, that's nothing, I'm 60. That's great, but it's a new season for me, right? We're, we're all, the seasons change. I just threw under the bus, told her age, right? Yeah. Number three, some seasons are more enjoyable than others. Number four, God works in every season. Look, you may think this season is not very productive for me, but God, every season is productive for God. God works in every season. God is doing something in your life. Philippians 1, 6. It is God, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's Philippians 2, 13. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hey, he is at work. You say, I don't see it. He's at work. Amen. Know it. God's leading you. He's always leading you. He's always at work. Number five. He gave this season is getting you ready for the next season. 
You know, there's preparation times in our life. I mean, you see that in Moses' life, don't you? You said nothing really happened big till he was 80. Oh, lots of big things were happening. It just was an internal work before it was an external work. On the backside of the desert, God was working him over. God was helping him know how to shepherd sheep so he would know how to shepherd his people. You see, I was just reading this morning about Paul. And I'm reading a chronological Bible, reaches chronological Bible. So rather than by book, it's putting everything chronologically. And it, it slipped in there in Galatians 1 right there in Acts when after Paul gets saved, as Saul at the time, um, he goes into Arabia for three years. And then he's back in Damascus. Well, Acts just continues with that part of it. doesn't mention the Arabia. And we don't know anything about Arabia other than he was there three years. But God was doing something in him. And that season of three years was preparing him for the next season. Every season. This season is getting you ready for the next season. It's number six, he gave every season is getting you ready for eternity. <laughs> every season is getting you ready and I ready for eternity. Someone said that this life is simply the dressing room. For real life, for eternity. God didn't come just to give us life. He gave us, give us life more abundantly. And thousands of years from now, after time has ended, and we're in the eternal state where the real time will be no more, we are going to think back, and this is going to seem like so long ago. And the, the struggles and the things you're dealing with in life are going to seem so insignificant. The things right now that seem like such mountains in front of you are going to seem like so small. You see, our God is so great and he knows what he's doing. He is always leading us. Oh, it was a great, great lesson he gave. The, the last one, let me give it to you. Number seven, stop trying to change your season and seek to know God in it. Stop trying to change your season and seek to know God in it. He said, quit trying to get out of the season you're in, but rather get out of the season what God wants you to get out of it. Quit trying to get out of that season, but get out of it what God wants you to get out of it. I don't want to retake the, the course. I want to get out of it this time what God wants me to learn in it, right? And then he ended with this thought, friend, he is the constant. He does not change. In every season, God wants to help you to know him better. Though things are changing, though we're getting older, though, though, though things are changing in our family, life is different. He is the constant that never changes, no matter the season. He's the same. God is always leading me. So God isn't just leading when the sun shines and the birds are singing. Everything's great. Everything's giggles and skittles. <laughs> okay. God is always leading. Even when it's dark. Even when the way is hard and the path is dark, you will find and God will show you if you let him that he's closer than ever before. And he is still leading. So he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For thou art with me. It's dark. I can't see him. Yeah, but know that he's there and he's leading. Oh, thank God for that. He'll comfort you. He'll encourage you. He'll give you strength to go on. Now, that's not the end of the story about Thursday night. While Brother Polly was talking to the men, Shane Lewis's wife, he's in heaven now, um, Joy Lewis was talking to the ladies. <laughs> well, after Caitlin showed me her notes, and I actually took a picture of them, sending to Brother Polly, because both were sharing from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and the title of hers was Seasons. <laughs> they didn't know this, and this is the five points she gave. Number one, realize that seasons are inevitable. They're part of life and they're vital. Number two, learn to enjoy the season that you're in. <laughs> Philippians 4.11. I've learned whatsoever state I am there with to be content, right? Number three, embrace your purpose and calling in every season. God has a purpose for everything. Be like Joseph in Genesis who embraced each season and stayed faithful. Number four, she gave, remember that trials are seasonal and purposeful. Number five, remember that seasons change, but God doesn't. That's the ultimate comfort. He's always the same and he leadeth me. God was meeting with us, I think, is what we realized. I told Brother Paulie, I said, look, it seemed like the Holy Spirit was guiding there, wasn't he? See, in every season of life, all the time, God is leading me. And God is always leading you. We may not always be following like we ought, but I want you to know God is leading and God is working. 
And God is drawing. And God doesn't quit. He doesn't take vacations. He doesn't go on holiday. He's not left you alone. And now we come to truth number three I want to get to this morning. Not only is God leading me, and God is always leading me. But look at verse number two there. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He leadeth me. I mean, if we were honest this morning, it's what all of us would say we really want. I want God to lead me. But we really don't want God to lead us. <laughs> you say, what? We really don't want it. Huh, pastor? You see, we want God to lead us where we want to go. <laughs> oh, yes, I want you to lead me. But if you don't mind, take me where I want to go. But that's not how it works. That's not how God works in our lives. Listen, you need to know this. I don't know where to go. You understand that? I don't know how to go and neither do you. Remember what Jesus said, John 14, 6. John 14, he told him, I'm going to prepare a place for you and told him all about it in the mansions and it's going to be great. And I'm going to come back and get you. And, and, and Thomas says, I've got a question, you know. And, uh, and one of the disciples, it may not have been Thomas, Philip. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He says, I've got a question. Lord, we don't know where it is and we don't know the way. <laughs> and that's a real issue. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You say, that's great for salvation, but it's not just for salvation. He is the way. In fact, it's interesting, I'm reading in Acts, like I said, this morning, and, and you know what they were called first, before they were called Christians in Antioch? You know what Paul was doing, then Saul, before he got saved? He was looking, and he had letters from Damascus to go after those of the way. That's what it says. The way. The way. Why? Because he was the way. Isn't that interesting? He is leading and he is the way. You say, Pastor, what are you really saying? Well, I'm saying truth number three. Let me give it to you. God's blessing depends on my submission. God's blessing that I enjoy in my life, that I desire, depends on my submission to him. You say, I want the still waters. I want the pacifiers. I want uh, that, that green pastures. But you don't have it unless you submit to him. He leadeth me beside the still waters. So the blessings that I want, that every one of us wants, God's blessing depends on my submission. Well, that's a dirty word in our day, isn't it? Submission. But we're not going to be led by the shepherd and enjoy all that we have preached about in the message, this message or all that we preached about in all the messages of Psalm 23 to this point and the truth, truths to come in Psalm 23 yet. We'll never enjoy any of them if we don't submit to the shepherd. See, God has established the principle of authority and submission to it. And you know, if I submit... To God every day, you know what's interesting? I have no problem submitting to God's ordained authority. <laughs> you know, I was a young person and uh, didn't want to obey my parents. That's the human nature, the sinful nature in every young person. And the devil loves to feed that. In our day, there's a number you can call if your parents try to make you do what you want to do and, and, and you can't express yourself freely. Mm -hmm. Violating children's rights, don't you know? <laughs> That's its sin nature in every one of us. But it's interesting when I began to get my life in line with the Lord and surrender to him and submit myself to him, I had no problem submitting to God ordained authority in my life. And when my pastor or my youth director or others spoke to me, it was no problem for me to submit to the things that I needed to change or add or subtract in my life. That was no problem. Why? Because I had already submitted to the one that ordained that authority in my life. All the blessings that you and I want and that we read about in Psalm 23 come from the submission of our lives to him. Oh, may God help us understand this truth. But if you won't submit to God, 
you'll find, as I have found, that you'll rebel against God-ordained authority in your life. Whether parent, whether husband, pastor, teacher, spiritual mentor, on and on. In fact, listen to Isaiah 58, 11. And the Lord shall guide thee continually. God leads you always. God is always leading me. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, Isaiah 58, 11, and satisfy thy soul in drought. Sounds like still waters, doesn't it? And make fat thy bones, sounds like green pastures, and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail now, not. Now, I know I'm getting old because I love gardens. I love watching things grow. And last year, my okra was like 20 some feet high. Right now, it's about a foot taller than me. My first batch didn't come up, so I had to replant. But I, every day, I, every morning, when Mary's mom was here, they, they, she decided to get up and see what okra and cucumbers we had. And we, we all were just dividing them up, eat them. We eat them raw. And okra is really good for, in fact, I heard okra is good for your cholesterol. It's one of the top, on the top five things. So if you have bad cholesterol, okra. Anyway, it's good raw. You might think it's funny, but anyway, that doesn't matter. I like watching things grow. <laughs> That's another way you can tell I'm getting old. I'm getting all these details that don't matter, right? <laughs> I like that, watching things grow. And seeing and going out, I love eating things from the garden, seeing that. And boy, if a garden's not watered, it's not good to look at, you don't get anything off it. God says he wants your life to be like a water garden. He wants my life to be like a water garden, a beautiful water garden. But it only happens, Isaiah 58, 11, when the Lord guides thee. Only he can sustain us. Only he can satisfy us. Turn with me, please, to John 16. Would you look there? We must allow God to guide us. Two places we're going to turn. Then we'll come back to Psalm 23. So hold your place. Look at John 16. John 16. This is that chapter, these chapters right before the crucifixion. Literally, we're days before, less than a week before the crucifixion. So we come to John 16, and he's trying to share things to his disciples and let them know what's coming. And one of the things he's telling them is, he, I'm about to leave you, and I'm about to go. And they don't want to hear that, as you can imagine. And that I'm not going to be with you anymore. In John 16, verse 7, look at it. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient. It's better for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Look at verse 13. Don't miss it. John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will, what's the next two words? Guide you. God is always leading. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. See, the Lord Jesus was helping them understand you'll not have any lack. You'll not have any want just because I leave because just as much as God the Father is God and God the Son is God, God the Holy Spirit is God. And not only will he be with you, he will be in you and he'll never leave you. And not only that, he, from the inside, as I've guided you physically, as you followed me as my disciples, he will guide you from this point forward. He'll guide you into all truth. This is better. This is expedient, he's saying. Because the Holy Spirit would indwell us and teach us and guide us. Listen, years ago, now more than 30 years ago, February 8th, 1992, I asked God to forgive my sin and by faith trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. He came into my life by the person of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit living in me and in you if you know Him as your Savior. Way back then, the Lord came to live within me. And ever since then, he's been guiding. He's been leading, but I've not grown like I should have grown. I've not grown how I could have grown. I have to admit that. Because the secret, the secret to growing in the Christian life is yielding to the shepherd. And the reason you meet Christians that are 20 years saved, but still a baby Christian or still in early stages of the Christian life or 30 years saved or 40 years saved 
It's because the difference between them and a th Christian who's only been saved three years, we think, man, this person is spiritually mature, is in their yielding to the shepherd. See, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you right now, but your growth in the Christian life is dependent on how you've yielded and submitted to your guide. We don't have a bunch of acreage back here, but if we imagine these pines were some huge acreage and we had a guide going to take us to show some things, you would not get very far if you won't follow the guide. <laughs> And we're not getting very far in our Christian life if we don't follow the guide. Listen, God is leading. He leadeth me. God is always leading. Oh, but am I following? Am I submitting and I'm yielding? If he's going to lead us, we must allow him to lead us. God has established this principle for our lives. In order for he to lead me, I must submit to him. Turn with me one last place, and we're back in Psalms. Go to Exodus, please. Exodus 14. Oh, the Lord says about this time in Israel's history that as the eagle, so the Lord worked to bring them to himself. Yeah, that's the meaning of life. God is always working to bring us to himself. In Exodus 14 here, this is the story of their exodus out of Egypt. And God bringing them out. And boy, what a rejoicing day that was. Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth, between Migdal and the sea over against baal -Siphon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. All right. Are they supposed to camp by the sea? And did God say that? Verse 2. Yeah, that's exactly what God said to do. Verse four, and I'll harden Pharaoh's heart and he shall follow after them and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Skip down to verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show to you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you. And ye shall hold your peace. Skip down to verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. He said, what are you trying to tell us, Pastor? The people, Israel, would have never chosen to go that way. Look, we're leaving Egypt and we're going to the promised land. Why are we going up against the sea? We've got to go around the sea. They would have never chosen to go that way. But God was leading them. Now take it and bring it to my life and your life. Think of how many things in your life you would have never chosen that way. You would have never gone that way and you could have never known to choose that way. But the Lord led you. There were valleys I would have never chosen and the situations I would have never chosen for myself. But the Lord is always leading. And God has got it. And think about it. We're still talking about the sea being parted and them walking across on dry ground. And it wasn't just deliverance for Israel. It was destruction for Egypt. You'll see them no more. And they didn't. God destroyed them there in that same. What was deliverance to Israel was destruction for Egypt. Think about that. Think what God did. The people could not have chosen to go that way. And it was not their choice to make, by the way. They were God's people. And here's what I want you to get. The direction God has for us is not our choice to make. He's the shepherd. He leadeth me. I'm going to repeat this a couple of times. I encourage you, if you're taking notes, write this down. The direction God has for us is not our choice to make. It is our choice to give our lives to God and leave the leading to him. Can you repeat that, Pastor? Sure. The direction God has for us is not our choice to make. Semicolon, if you want. It is our choice to give our lives to God 
and leave the leading to him. He leadeth me. You see, the shepherd makes all the difference. I'm glad for what God has done in my life. I'm glad for what he's teaching me right now. I'm so grateful that he is leading me and that he is always leading me. Well, the truth is, I'd have never chosen so many things in my life. I would not have been smart enough to pick them. I wouldn't have gone that way. It wouldn't have looked like the right way. And walking to the edge of the sea, where are we going to go? A rock on this side, a mountain on this side. What are we doing here, Moses? Were there not graves in Egypt? You brought us here to kill us? They'd have never chosen that way. But God said to go there, and they did. And God opened the way before them. He leadeth me. Again, it's not about us making a choice about the way we're to go. Our choice is to submit to him. Praise his holy name. He leadeth me. He knew all along what he was doing. And I must trust and you must trust that tomorrow with whatever we face, our God knows exactly what he's doing. Think of that. Think of what God could do in this place, in your family, in our lives, if only we were willing to be submissive, to submit to him. Did you know that happiness is a byproduct of obedience? Submission. Happiness. You see, we think we'll be happy if we get our own way. <laughs> that's what we think. Okay, watch a child that's always fighting for their way. All the time. Even if they get it, is that a happy child? Or watch a child whose parents have spanked them and taught them submission to authority, obedience. Can you see the two children in your mind? Which one's happy? It's always amazing to me to watch. Parents, oh, I, I just love my children so much, I would never say. Those children are miserable. They're not happy. Because getting your way doesn't make you happy. <laughs> Happiness is a byproduct of submission to authority, of obedience. Okay, let's bring it to adulthood. Look around. The people that have everything, that are doing everything in life they think they want, that... Are they happy? Read about the celebrities, the rich people. Read about uh, the politicians that have so much. Read about uh, uh, the, the, the movie stars and the, and, and the sports stars and all these that have the money. Are they happy? Okay. Well, no. <laughs> no, I don't think they're happy. Where are the happy people? I'd submit they're people that have allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to be their shepherd. And have learned living their lives submitted to the shepherd under his ruling presence in their life. Look, in order for our shepherd to lead us, we must be submissive to his will for our lives. That's where you'll find the happy people. Happiness is a byproduct of obedience. Who knows more about our lives than the shepherd? Do we know more about our lives or does God know more about our lives? Who knows more about why we were created? You have a purpose. God made you for something. Who knows more about that than God? Why do we make such disasters of our lives? Because we try to run our own lives. Why do we cause such heartache in the lives of others? Because we try to manage our lives and we say, I'm going to be my own boss and no one's going to tell me what to do. But we must come to a place of submission if we expect our shepherd to lead us. Do you understand? Everything else in life is settled when this is settled. He leadeth me. Listen, this morning our battle is not with people. It's with yielding to Christ, the shepherd. Would you examine your life? You might say, I'm battling my husband. I, I'm battling my wife and my children. I'm battling these teenagers. I'm battling my boss. But look, look again. Let God open your eyes to see. See if the real struggle may be that you've not yielded yourself to God. To be the husband, the wife, the father, the mother, the teenager God wants you to be. Look, if God is going to lead us, we have to submit to him. 
again, like I said, all of us would say, I want God to lead me. That's what I want. But we really don't. We want God to lead us where we want him. We want God to lead us where we want him to lead us. We want God to lead us where we want to go. But our way to get God to lead us, it doesn't work by him having to tell us everything. It works by us up front saying, God, I'll be your sheep. You be the shepherd. Amen. Shepherd doesn't ask the sheep. He doesn't ask the sheep if he wants to go. The shepherd leads the sheep where it's best for him to go. Because the sheep's not smart enough to make that decision. Neither am I. Neither are you. God leads us. Would you examine your life? We must be in submission to the shepherd. God's blessing depends on my submission. And now that title, the shepherd makes all the difference. <laughs> Have you lived long enough to see that we are all submitting to something or someone? We are all following. Every person is following something or someone. We're all submitting to someone. You see, the dirty little secret is there is no OG. There is no originals besides God. And if you're in rebellion to God, that simply means that you're following Satan and submitting to him. What you think is freedom is actually chains. But man, if you have him as your shepherd, the shepherd makes all the difference. The devil's a cruel taskmaster. This world will use and abuse and dispose. But our shepherd, all the days of our lives will lead us. And then we dwell in his house forever. What makes the difference between this person and that person? I mean, we're all submitting to someone. I mean, those even raised in the same home like Ishmael and Isaac. What makes the difference between this person and that person? People that were raised in your home, in your family, your siblings. Why is one living for the world? Why is one look like the world and act like the world and go in that direction? Raised in the same home and another one following the Lord, living for God. What makes the difference? The shepherd. The shepherd makes all the difference. See, we're all submitting to someone. We're all being led by someone. What makes all the difference is if Jesus is your shepherd. What makes all the difference is who you're submitting to. And knowing in a greater way every day. Are you submitting to the good, the great, the chief shepherd of your soul every day? The Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say truly he leadeth me. The shepherd makes all the difference. I'll share this story and I'm through. Many years ago, one of England's leading actors was at a dinner party. <laughs> and he wasn't there to act. He was just there with other guests. And for the pleasure of the other guests, he was asked to recite something. And he consented and asked if there's anything special the audience wanted to hear. Well, no one really said anything up front, and so there was an old clergyman there, and he said, yeah, I'd like you to recite Psalm 23. Actor kind of gave him a strange look and kind of paused, and then he said this, I can, and I will, upon one condition, and that is that after I've recited it, you, my friend, will do the same. Me? <laughs> clergyman said, I'm not a professional, eloquent guy, I but if you wish, I'll do it. And so the actor took off into Psalm 23 impressively. His voice intonation was perfect. He pronounced every word. The audience was held spellbound as he gave Psalm 23. And when he finished, people stood and a great burst of applause was heard. Then as it ended, the old clergyman stood to his feet and began the psalm. His voice was not remarkable. His intonation was not faultless. And when he has finished, this, the room was silent. When there was no sound of applause. But there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Many heads were bowed. Then the actor rose to his feet again, put his hand on that clergyman. And as his voice shook, he said this. He said, I reached your ears. 
I reached your head and your eyes, my friends. He reached your hearts. You see, because I know Psalm 23, but he knows the shepherd. The shepherd makes all the difference.